Okay, this is going to be a brief introductory lecture to the concept of confidence as applied to sport and performance psychology. We're going to keep it introductory and so you'll see a similar theme and a similar approach in most textbooks. And of course, if you need to investigate further, for example, for your assignment, then you're going to have to go and look beyond textbooks and actually into the research articles and uh, summaries of research that actually will take us further down this path because there's plenty more to investigate than what is you can fit into one lecture. You'll also hear it called uh, self-esteem or self-efficacy. Those are similar concepts. We could spend some time debating how similar or how different. We're going to treat them as broadly the same for now. And anything where you are making a judgment of your capacity to undertake a task or overcome a challenge, and if you happen to believe that you can, we would probably call that confidence. That's a nice place to start at least. We're going to define confidence, we're going to look at what the benefits might be, um, and look at how it might be conceptualised and measured in terms of levels perhaps, because that's often how it's talked about, colloquially at least. We're going to look at relationship between expectation and performance and then briefly look at some of the theories. And then towards the end we're going to look at some of the ways that people try and support confidence either in themselves or in their athletes. And they're going to be presented as um, almost just bullet points, but each one is a strategy which you could use. But before you did that, you would want to go and check what the science says about whether it actually works. And by whether it works, you would say, you know, the sort of golden outcome would be to improve performance. But actually, you could also ask simply, does it improve confidence? It's just worth pausing perhaps and saying, okay, well, what situations make someone confident? Uh, is it, for example, standing in front of a lecture theatre full of people or giving an online broadcast like this? Can you feel confident in that situation? And would perhaps the next person you ask feel confident doing that? And in that case, what's different? There's a, a period in my life where I could never have given a presentation when I was a bit younger, perhaps the age of you. When I first arrived at university, giving presentations was, was pretty terrifying, but now I'll stand in front of a room and actually giving online lectures, I kind of miss the buzz of having a room full of people to talk to. So there's something that's changed quite substantially, and of course, what probably changed is my knowledge went up of the subject material, of course, but also my experience of talking to large audiences went up, and I was able to actually use the audience and bounce off the energy in the room. So I became experienced and skilled at the task itself. So suddenly, my judgment of my competence would be very different to how it was when I was about 18, 19. You can also say, well, what about people who just are naturally confident? Is that just a thing where you can just naturally be a confident person? And it's possible, but again, it, you, we usually see that it wouldn't always apply across all contexts. Someone could generally have a preference to, to show faith in their ability, but uh, usually you'll find some challenge or some task where they say, mm, I'm not feeling so good about this. And if it so happens that that's a particularly important outcome or important consequences, then they might still feel nervous. So there's a, we'll often actually measure people's general tendency or their trait to be confident, but also we'll often measure the situational or contextual confidence around how do you feel here and now doing this task. And then that'll be a function of the environment of course, the nature of the task. It's a very simple definition to start off with, it's just the belief you can successfully perform a desired behaviour. Now I think we need to perhaps look at other definitions and perhaps unpack that one along the way, but in its simplest form, do you believe you can do what's been put in front of you, what the job you've been asked to do? And we would say that's some kind of confidence. At the trait level, we might say, okay, the person generally tends to have that approach, usually back themselves. But then state confidence is exactly how you feel right now, given what you've just been asked to do. We often see that there's this self-fulfilling prophecy. So there's that Gandhi quote that if you think you can, or if you think you can't, you're probably right. And to some extent, the belief you hold about that would probably come from previous experience and knowledge of practice, for example. So it's possible that your self-judgment is 
informed by facts and therefore it's actually quite accurate so what you know it would become a self-fulfilling prophecy also possible that people who underrate their ability can actually end up making that uh, a failure happen because they didn't back themselves so it's surprisingly common actually for people who've done the practice and are extremely skillful to actually struggle in important moments because their confidence fails them and therefore they become nervous and then all kinds of issues with attention and stress and anxiety can come along. A lot of researchers looked at differences in confidence between high achievers, low achievers, elite, non-elite athletes and it's often the case that of course high achievers or high performers have more confidence but that shouldn't be surprising because they've probably practiced an awful lot more and achieved an awful lot more and that would give you confidence. We also see that athletes who are confident and expect to succeed are often the ones who do. Again, that could be misleading because it might be that that judgment is based on genuine knowledge and practice and therefore they should feel confident. And of course, the same practice and knowledge of practice would predict the performance without having to think about confidence in between it could just be a, a byproduct that so happens to predict success as well so we need to be careful how we think about confidence on the one hand people who are good appear to be confident confident but that also shouldn't be surprising um, does it mean that confidence is what makes you good probably not it just happens that if you actually damage people's confidence when they are perfectly good then often that can lead to subpar performances so that's a, a messy story so we need to try and get to the bottom of where it fits in, in in predicting performance and of course actually confidence is really important for mental health as well the benefits that we can easily find in terms of just giving out questionnaires and saying how confident are you and how do you feel or some other judgment about yourself usually feeling confident will be linked with experiencing positive emotions uh, it's often linked with finding it easier to concentrate because there's less self-doubt and less distracting thoughts it often means that people will pick goals or challenges for themselves that are just slightly harder and perhaps even just beyond their current capability because they're prepared to challenge themselves it usually means you'll see increased effort because someone who's confident isn't likely to to believe that they've hit their limit. Some of the loving confidence, once they realize that they're, they're perhaps starting to struggle, you will see something called self-handicapping where they actually withdraw effort and say, well, you know, what's the point? Or even sometimes feigning injury or you know, having an excuse. So actually, you often see people who are confident will stick with it longer because they know they'll get there in the end. Strategically, you'll see people who are confident setting out to actually play to win as opposed to playing not to lose. Now often we watch sport on TV and we'll, we'll be able to see some difference like that. So the recent Origin series there was an argument that the, in the third match the New South Wales team set out to defend and at least not lose or at least keep it close and that strategy failed very badly and they ended up being uh, a long way behind and cut to shreds and then motivationally they were, they were gone as well. And the idea is that people's level of confidence in their ability predicts the strategy they would take. You see some teams in various sports, some athletes, take a very positive approach without any apparent fear of losing or failing because they thoroughly believe they're going to win and it's just a matter of getting on with it and doing it well. Strategically, you often see people take a very different approach if they're trying not to lose or trying to limit the damage. There was a concept of momentum at one point and it's kind of received less attention after it first came to light in the early 2000s but confidence was also linked to this idea of momentum whereby a team or an individual who appeared to be on a bit of a run perhaps in form or perhaps even within a game if they're feeling confident then that momentum can be maintained and it can last a bit longer i haven't seen many papers on that in the last few years though so it may have just gone out of fashion The simplest definition, the simplest conceptualization of confidence is the inverted U which gets used for many different things. It could be used for motivation, arousal and confidence. And we have to accept before we even look at it, it's obviously a huge 
oversimplification and it's kind of just reflective of how people will talk about it when watching sport or perhaps in the pub with their mates it probably doesn't give us a scientific understanding of how confidence really works so you might say oh there's an optimal level there's uh, under confident and overconfident and only optimal is good and either side of that is bad performance so you get an inverted u now of course that doesn't really help us much at all actually apart from this really simplistic toehold in in the area because underconfident and overconfident might be different uh, levels of objective confidence uh, for different athletes and we do try and measure confidence objectively sometimes with questionnaires, <coughs> questionnaires so it might be that you get different scores and yet both athletes are just right it could also vary depending on the sport so really quickly start to see this is a problem because just right or over or under is going to depend on the person on the sport perhaps on their fitness and training and so suddenly uh, this doesn't actually help us to do anything apart from uh, sound clever to somebody who hasn't heard of it but once they have and they've thought about it for long enough the problems become apparent very quickly it doesn't also it doesn't tell us what to do about confidence which is really important so there's no how it works there's no kind of therefore what to do about it so it's pretty unhelpful it's more of a, a basic model than a an informative scientific theory, I would say. So thinking about expectations, I've mentioned before that of course they'll be based on, hopefully, some evaluation of your training and practice, but they appear to play an important role in predicting future performance. So generally speaking, if someone has quite high expectations and they're justified, then, and that's coming from the self, then that's usually a good predictor of, of performance. It's of, of course possible therefore that the coach or teacher who also was there during your practice can also have an accurate expectation and therefore accurately predict roughly what's going to happen. There is a problem of course when expectations are um, coming from the media and the public or perhaps a really pushy coach who expects too much and then suddenly the expectations can far exceed what's possible and that can end up causing anxiety whereby you worry about not meeting expectations. Um, so we need to be careful with expectations, but generally if the athlete has positive expectations and that's justified by their practice and training and performances to date, then we should be in a good place. So you would say, okay, yeah, the coach forms expectations based on um, the, the nature of the athlete and what they've seen in terms of performance and training. Uh, and of course, being too, having expectations that are too high would be a big problem. Uh, and then uh, the idea is that coach expectations actually may influence the athlete's expectations. If you constantly show faith in someone, they might start to go, well, if this person ranks me, I must be actually, maybe I am okay. So it's possible that through the interactions and the constant reinforcement and the constant perhaps acceptance of failure because someone's learning and they're having to hit their limit and fail in order to keep improving and you can often show that a positive attitude and a tolerance of that and that can rub off on the athletes just because you're constantly around them and your emotions and your physical interpersonal cues show how you feel of course if you're mixing that in with more positive feedback and not focusing on the negatives then that also would be generally boosting the athlete based on the fact that yeah you expect the athlete is fine so that coach expectation starts to rub off on the athlete that of course then might lead to improved performances for the athlete if they start to feel more confident and then that would actually become self-fulfilling so there's two layers of self-fulfilling prophecy there's the athlete's own expectations can be self-fulfilling and it's possible that through a slightly longer causal chain the coach's expectations can be self-fulfilling if the athlete picks up on that and starts to gain confidence themselves. So, it's that starts to show us that confidence can exist in groups. That was a very simple example of coach influencing an athlete. But also you start to see that athletes work in teams. Sometimes you have multiple teams from the same club going out to perform 
sometimes you have multiple athletes wearing the same kit but not actually competing together. They compete in different races but under the same flag. And yet it's possible for that confidence to grow and to have a series of confident building interactions and therefore everyone starts to get a bit of a buzz and starts to gain some belief that maybe we're going to do okay here. So it's worth contemplating exactly how would that work and how would we test it because that's usually something which has been less well understood. Hypothetically it should work and you'll hear stories of it working but scientifically how would we test that? What would you have as a independent variable that you introduce and what would you measure as a dependent variable? That could be a fun little study. One of the favourite theories of confidence is self-efficacy theory, and sometimes you'll hear confidence referred to as self-efficacy. It was really um, Albert Bandura who, who put this full theory forward, along with some others. He's, he was pretty um, prolific in his time. And he defines it as the perception of one's ability to perform a task successfully, situation-specific. So slightly more refined than our first attempt at a definition. Perception of one's ability to perform a task. So it is a subjective perception, not an objective thing. The person can have an incorrect perception of how good they are. And it's focusing on a specific task, a specific situation. Gets used to mean self-belief, self-confidence quite often. And therefore it could be viewed as a situation-specific self-confidence. And so I was alluding earlier that people might feel confident in one situation but change it slightly or perhaps another situation completely and they would not feel as confident. What we then say is, okay, that would, as we often predict, determine someone's strategy. So they might um, have approach motivation or avoidance motivation they might change their strategy, they might have different uh, expectations and different um, emotions going into the event. So a similar kind of basic, broad theoretical approach to what we've talked about so far, but now couched within self-efficacy theory. One of the most useful aspects of the theory is it tries to say there are core sources of that confidence, of that self-efficacy, and they are previous performance accomplishments, really good indicator of how you're going to perform next time. What he called vicarious experiences, so modelling perhaps of seeing somebody else like you do it or videos of yourself recently doing it, um, or perhaps just someone showing you that it's possible. Someone's emotional arousal state, so that actually on the one hand your confidence level may affect your emotions, but we also seem to use our current emotions as an indicator of how confident you feel. So you might be given a completely fresh task you've never seen before, and when asked how confident are you, you might say, well, I feel pretty calm, so I guess I'm pretty confident. And we actually seem to work it backwards sometimes as well. So Bandura included that in the model as a possible source. And verbal persuasion, be it from a coach or be it through the way you talk to yourself in the moment, it's possible that those, those phrases and those words can become important sources of confidence self-efficacy in this case. So fairly obviously in past performances if you've tended to do well should increase your expectations of doing well in future. If you've tended to do badly would lower your expectations. Really important there it's a perception. So if someone has won all their matches but they think they've played badly they may still be entering the next match with low self-efficacy. So the vicarious experiences is usually thought of as modelling or some kind of demonstration. Um, and it's the when people say you know parents live vicariously through their children. That's one of the sort of ways parents get to feel good about life is seeing somebody else do well, their child, but they take it as a reflection upon themselves. And so quite often, the closer the the model is, whether it be a video of yourself or a video of someone your age and ability level, if you're able to have that modelled for you. Mm. The closer the approximation to you, the more you can take from it. And of course for most people living vicariously through their children, it's hard to get much closer because that person's at least half you and has been raised by you as well. It's generally thought of as, as very popular. How we actually test it is it's still up for debate. Some people have tested it in quite unique contexts. You're welcome to go and look and see, okay, well, who has tested vicarious experience as a source of self-efficacy, particularly in sport. 
social persuasion wise okay you can say you know people can be trying to persuade you that you're good sometimes it's hit and miss sometimes you don't want to hear that information at certain points in time and then we'll often actually as i say do a scan of our emotions and physiology and actually use that to, as a judgment of whether to be confident even though being confident can affect your emotions so it was a useful framework and actually it gives us a very quick way of saying if you want to build confidence what are the sorts of things that you can look for to draw on it should be predictive in the same way as we've talked to before whereby it's based on previous performances which is an excellent predictor of future performances and it should predict things like the level of difficulty that a task cho an athlete chooses the level of effort they exhibit the persistence on that task so it actually starts to specify some things we can test it might be that if you are self-efficacy is high in, in a particular situation then another similar situation may benefit. You may see um, self efficacy transfers between similar situations or perhaps things that happen close together in time, but a very different situation or perhaps with a sufficient time gap and you wouldn't get that transfer of efficacy from one to the other. And you would generally, of course, see people who are high in self-efficacy setting themselves more challenging goals. You can flesh out the model slightly and uh, so we've got forward accomplishments still, vicarious experiences still, verbal persuasion which I think can come from the self or others, so self-talk is one of the sources we try and use, emotional arousal and the physiological state which originally were one thing and as the model evolved they've become two and there's also imaginal experiences so we talk about um, using imagery perhaps to imagine yourself doing well as a source of confidence not just as a source of perhaps motor learning the source of confidence as well and then confidence or self-efficacy should predict performance so we're starting to see a fairly structured model emerging here generally speaking of course previous accomplishments should be the most dependable source um, and the challenge then becomes well what if someone's had a little bad run how do you overcome that and how do you still go into the next competition feeling confident or having high self-efficacy. We've talked about modelling, vicarious experiences, we've talked about persuasion, so really we've covered most of these and the, the trick is that these become a kind of a go-to list of ways of boosting confidence or self-efficacy. So if you have, have some doubt or the athletes demonstrating a lack of confidence, this could be a quick mental checklist of things you could try to help. When modelling specifically, you would okay say, well, um, you need to make sure that the person is paying attention and particular attention to the, the right person, perhaps in the demonstration or on the video. Um, and then you would want to make sure that there's an element of uh, retention, so there's sufficient de demonstration for it to be remembered, or perhaps at least uh, highly memorable. You would want quickly if we're doing it in the formal sense you would want some actual reproduction quite quickly of the movement or of the event so to facilitate that transition from well that person can do it and I can do it as well and then hopefully I guess you'd reinforce it and, and add some motivation to say look see this is possible you can do it what we see is that generally speaking those with higher self-efficacy will exhibit higher effort, they'll persist longer, they'll feel better during the actual task. Um, and then we hit this interesting finding potentially that women in sport will generally have lower levels of self-efficacy. And that begins to raise the question of, well, is it that women are generally lower in confidence? Or is it the case that perhaps uh, a lot of what we see in sport is very male-dominated and very kind of macho? And so in that situation, is it, would we expect women to be a bit less confident and perhaps we should look at the context and the expectations and change those rather than concluding that women were less confident naturally. This was a debate that happened kind of through the 70s and 80s and it was you know interesting to see and in some ways 
perhaps it's worth revisiting at some point soon to work out uh, if we finish that argument or if we need to go back and, and do some more research. One of the more interesting findings is uh, a theory of motivation which went back to attributions and how we attribute the causes of an event and therefore that explains what happened or what's likely to happen in the future. And you can divide these up into people who believe that uh, events are entirely caused by external causes or entirely caused by themselves uh, or whether events are controllable in some way versus uncontrollable. And people who are high in confidence will generally assign the causes to being quite personal, an internal locus of control, and quite controllable. Whereas people who tend to, in sport in particular, lack confidence are saying, well, the reason that at most outcomes occur is totally uncontrollable and totally not me. Uh, in particular, if you start to think that uh, Maybe if you are, if it is something to do with you, but you can't control it, then that's even more damaging to confidence. So, well, it is me, and I've got no idea how to fix it, so, hmm. And that would be even more damaging. So, really starting to notice this uh, this association. And again, it was easy to do because we just throw out questionnaires and we get the results back and see correlations. But the link is there nonetheless. And it's not surprising to see that that, you know, that pattern emerges. So now we hit a third theory of confidence in sport, and this one was particularly designed in sport. So the previous ones we've talked about um, were borrowed from elsewhere, and one of the strengths, if you can call it that, is that this was developed in sport, so it's sport specific. The idea, the different definition here, the belief or degree of certainty individuals possess about their ability to be successful in sport, and that definition is sufficiently different that it, it might actually have a different meaning, a different thing to the previous definitions we've used. There's, there are different aspects in there, so this is very sport specific, but it's actually those last five, six words talking about success in sport, not success in a given task, and the task might change. Fairly unsurprisingly, uh, Billy has gone back to talking about the trait type of confidence where a person is generally confident, but then also perhaps looking at the specifics of the situation as well. So Vili would say there was the trait confidence and then the particular competitive orientation and those things interact to give this immediate state level of self-confidence. So you might say an athlete who is very successful at one sport might transfer most of the confidence from that to other sport situations and just sport in general. So it focuses on the transferability of confidence between sporty activities. Of course, though, there's a lot of variation in the nature of a task under the banner of sport in general. So really develop that theory and develop the questionnaire. And of course, therefore, you can do lots of research on, on those questionnaires. As I say, it's just worth pausing for a second and saying, the, the gender th issue has never quite been resolved. So on the one hand, you see that women and men tend to have different levels of confidence, but one of the reasons might be to do with the type of the sport. So you might say, okay, what about American football seems very macho and then ballet seems very feminine and then something more neutral. And actually you can tend to find that the contextual expectations are quite good indicators of um, the differences that you see. So it's not that one gender or sex is less confident in general, it depends on the context. And of course, lots of sporting contexts seem to emphasize masculine macho values. So if we go for the tips that we can offer at this point in time, basic um, just useful rules of thumb that, you know, scientifically you should think about how we would test that and how you would do an experiment to test it. But just off the cuff, you can say things like, right, read to it, emphasize perhaps the relative importance. And actually sometimes people overemphasize the importance of an event whereby it can create pressure. Often for the sake of confidence, you want to give people a sense of perspective in terms of where this really fits into the rest of their life and 
and the rest of the world because taking away all that pressure is a good way of actually supporting someone's confidence. You don't want to be making them think their life depends on the next hour of sport. It's useful to, to have models and there could be people who've succeeded from a similar situation or people who share similar attributes to your athlete but usually it's nice to have those role models for confidence at least. Try and reduce distractions because you want people to uh, actually think about what they're good at and how they're going to use those strengths. So there's an entire movement around positive psychology whereby you're aware of your strengths and you use those rather than what happens typically is you're aware of your weaknesses and trying to avoid being tripped up. So actually letting people focus on what they're good at and have some faith in that and not get into self-doubt where very often we'll start thinking, once we doubt ourselves and have a, a concern, we have to start analysing and thinking more. And in sport, that's generally quite a bad tactic to, to go and do motor movements. You want to have less thought and more doing. So avoiding distractions, avoiding doubt, pretty important. Uh, when you're trying to convey uh, that you have belief in someone, of course, body language is very important. So eye contact, uh, emotional kind of backing it up, actually really meaning what you're saying, is also really important. When you want someone to actually be able to uh, understand the technique, for example, that you're modeling and, and demonstrating, then you would want them to see it from different angles and perhaps uh, even try it in different ways so that they feel that not only is, have they seen a good example, but they can generalize across different situations. And, and again, very quickly you'd want to reinforce that by letting them try. And generally speaking, we only focus on a couple of points because we have a limited bandwidth of information that we can absorb during learning. Mental rehearsal is key. We saw it in Bandura's theory. It crops up in most theories as a way of boosting both motor learning and also confidence. So you'd want pretty quickly, if somebody is capable of doing mental imagery, you'd want to use that pretty quickly in the demonstration equation. And also you'd want to practice it, like I said. It's possible to break skills down, if they're complex skills, into subunits or subsections. Um, and one of the things that you get from a textbook, but again, we need to be critical and think whether these things work as it says on the tin or if they're being overhyped. You might say, okay, well, let's slow it down and at least build up to, to full speed that way. These are all being presented as ways of boosting confidence and they're all straight out of the Weinberg and Gould textbook it would be worth just checking, okay, what's the evidence? And if somebody hasn't tested it well enough, how would I test it? We can reinforce correct performances or correct aspects of performance. And again, that should be improving confidence. And of course, then you want to accumulate a, a memory bank of positive performances and, and achievements so that the person actually looks back and goes, I've done it, I'm quite good at this. One example of how I measure confidence is the State Trait Sport Confidence Inventory, and this was uh, based on Bailey's theory. There are more uh, questionnaires out there, and in fact there's quite a lot of questionnaires to measure confidence. You should always check how they've been validated and, and what they predict, because uh, sometimes you end up with ways of measuring confidence that aren't what you want to know, for example. And sometimes you find ways of measuring confidence that aren't right for your age group or your particular skill level. Uh, and so you can end up adopting a measure into a study that's just not appropriate at all for what you're trying to achieve. Sometimes you find measures that just don't hold together. So when used in multiple studies, they actually start to show uh, signs of weakness and perhaps we shouldn't be using them after all. So this is one. And I'd recommend that you just keep your eyes and ears open if you want to go and do your additional work on self-confidence, just look out for the, the ways we measure it. And very often we're looking at questionnaires where the person fills in, this is how I feel, either generally trait confidence or in this moment in relation to this task, and that would be state confidence. I once used this slide with a, a rugby team I was working with just because it was a quick summary of what we we're trying to say. Confidence 
seems to be a situation where you have belief in yourself, but equally you're not fearing doing badly. And if someone is, is fearing doing badly, then actually belief can be kind of swallowed up and lost in the equation because the fear can become primary. So ideally we want to somehow deal with those fears separately and have them dealt with and fixed. You can't ignore them, but just I've got that like squared away. I'm happy with what happens if I fail. And then think about the belief side. Self-talk, classic technique, used for a lot of things, definitely used for improving confidence. Focusing on successes, imagery-wise, we're just making a list. Then we can use imagery of success and, and good, strong performances. Actually, strong preparation is key. So we interviewed some golfers in some studies that we did, and they would just cite uh, feeling their preparations of being good as a key reason. In terms of getting ready that morning and getting their kit together, that gives people confidence. Um, and that hasn't been in the, the rest of the talk so far, so it's interesting. Um, and actually, if you have goals for yourself, then achieving them and knowing that you've ticked them off along the way is also another good way of supporting confidence. To, to avoid the fear of failure, then it's worth questioning the consequences. A lot of children interviewed uh, alongside the research I was doing when I was at Loughborough um, said, well, fear, failing isn't that bad, it's just if there are consequences to failing and, and I'm worried about those, then I would fear failing, obviously. So that's interesting, and sometimes if you minimise the consequences and make them less problematic, the fear of failure itself goes away. You can, and you can therefore question the, the consequences and say, well, is that really going to happen? Are the people who love me really going to stop loving me? Is my family going to care if, or think differently of me? And quite often it's not actually a big problem at all. Another really important thing with failure is just it's not an end point. Uh, in fact, most people who succeed will talk about viewing failure as an indication that they're trying their absolute hardest and they're on their limit. So you should often be trying to deliberately go and find failure as soon as possible in your training and then pushing from there as opposed to having an entire training regime of not failing and then really worrying about it when the competition comes. Quick advice you might give to coaches might be okay. Um, try and stay positive. Try and have high expectations. Not unreasonably high, but just show that you have belief in them. Set realistic but challenging goals, short and long term. Uh, lots of reinforcement and praise, but of course not you know silly praise. Actually, you know we're doing what we set out to do here. Well done, guys. Um, try and create an environment where success is possible and likely so that people can, as they progress through a training session or as they progress through a season, actually look back and see, I have achieved stuff here. I've got better than I was before. And if the environment makes that um, progress clear, then it should support confidence. And, you know, sometimes it's better just to look for the, the correct things as opposed to looking for the faults. And I've certainly interviewed people who, who have coaches who only look for faults and they find it both damaging to confidence and damaging to motivation. Uh, really, obviously, we would say things like, let's not use sarcasm, let's not use put-downs, um, let's not allow or ever encourage athletes and teams to actually um, put each other down or criticise each other. Uh, where mistakes happen, most of the mistakes we see in our athletes won't matter, they're just part of training. And if they're made in the right spirit because someone's trying to improve, then we probably shouldn't criticise every single mistake because then people become scared of making mistakes and start to fear failure. And certainly if we actually introduce consequences like embarrassment and shame and social judgement, then we're going to make people more and more sensitive about failure when, theoretically, you want to be failing a lot so that you are improving. And, you know, if you're failing at your limit, that's probably a good thing. And of course, generally speaking, we don't criticise, this is like advice almost for you know, parents of kids, we don't criticise the person in a permanent sense so that it's, that's the label, you, you are bad. We generally try and criticise the behaviour that happens. So effectively it becomes, look, you're a good person, but that thing you just did was bad. That skill you just executed wasn't right. So it's less personal. And if, if people feel that it's a label and it's stuck and it ain't going to change, they often react quite badly. Whereas if you your criticism even shows that 
I think you can get better, but what you just did wasn't right. Even that's a, a benefit and a, per, a, a plus. So this uh, talk, to my knowledge, is focused on the structure you'll see in the Weinberg and Gould book. Uh, it was originally based on the, the slides that came with, with their book, as I recall, a long time ago. So it's an introduction. It gets you off the, off the taxi rank, so to speak. But there's plenty more to go and investigate. Even quite recently, there were some talks by uh, some papers by Kate Hayes, who went really far into interviewing people about how their confidence is managed and dealt with. And I'd recommend those papers definitely. But at least you now have a starting point, and hopefully some indications of where you could look to go and do a really interesting research proposal if that's what you'd like to do. So for now, hope that was useful. See you next time.